cursor rules and why they're really important for you as a software engineer to help you get better outputs from cursor. There's a couple of different ways that you can add cursor rules to your projects. The global way you can do this is by going into your cursor and then going to the top left, clicking on settings, go to cursor settings, and then you have this global rules section that you can add in. So for example, we've had here, always make strongly typed React code and use functional programming. So by adding a global cursor rules section, this will apply on any project that you're specifically choosing. The reason why you want to use cursor rules files is that basically mean that your outputs are more standardized. I don't recommend using a global rules setup. However, what I do recommend using is the .cursor rules file, which allows you to apply project specific rules. For example, you can see I've got a very detailed project description here about the tech stack that we're using, where end-to-end -end tests should go, the style of the code. We've also got naming conventions. We've also got what the UI is being used for and some additional key conventions here. Now, one extra thing that I'd recommend having a look at is a website called cursor directory. And this website provides you with a bunch of boilerplate examples for your .cursor rules files that you can easily copy and edit. So for example, we could go to TypeScript or Tailwind or Laravel, and then we could easily click to copy this and then put that into our cursor rules file. And then we've got a cursor rules file that we can then start iterating on. After you've copied across a cursor rules file, the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is whenever you encounter a bug, you should actually document this inside of your .cursor rules file. The reason why is if you document these bugs, then they're gonna be less likely to happen as cursor is gonna always check your .cursor rules file every single time when it's making a generation and it will pull that in as dynamic context. Let's have a look at a real life example of how this could be applied. So for example, if we have a look at the Next.js 15 upgrade, the cookies function has become a promise based function, which means we now need to await cookies. We also need to do that on the dynamic params. One way we could do this is we could basically say, we could copy some of this code and we could put this into our cursor rules file after experiencing the bug. So I could say, uh, whenever you are using uh, params or cookies, uh, these need to be awaited and I'll put dynamic params here. Dynamic route params. And then we could say, so let's give it an example. So we'll say cookies is like this. From next headers. And then the other example we could also give is whenever you are using params, the params are a promise. Uh, and let's do a TypeScript block. And there we go. So now we've got both of these types of problems that we've experienced when upgrading to Next.js 15. And we've encoded these directly into the .cursor rules file. That means when we create dynamic routes or we use cookies in the future, we're less likely to experience these bugs uh, because the Claude chat model hasn't upgraded its foundational knowledge, we're supplementing the Claude chat model or the GPT-40 model with these newer changes that we're currently experiencing on our modern projects. Remember to use the cursor rules file, check out the cursor.directory website, and also remember to iteratively improve your cursor rules file as you experience real world problems so that you don't experience them again. Cool, follow for more cursor videos.